Well, undoubtedly a genius. And I don't use that term loosely, but there's no other way to explain the extent of his reading, uh, his ability to recall. It's said, you know, it, I've read where some of his friends that have been interviewed have said that he would read a, a, a poem, a of, of quite, quite complex poem, a couple of times and be able to recite it from memory. Well, if that's true, that's almost total recall. Or I don't know that he had a photographic memory, but if you read his collected poems, you see all of these historical allusions and, you, and it's full of characters. He created worlds, maps, cultures, civilizations. I mean, you know, that's, that's an enormous task. It sort of overwhelms me because, I mean, I didn't publish my first collection until I was in my early 50s, and I'd written for 30 years. So you're talking about a, a very slow process of, of, of a poet's developing, you know, and a, a poet who could write anything memorable. So he was a phenom of, of sorts. I mean, I, I don't know of any other way to explain it. I'm just... Uh, and I'm not a Howard fanatic, not, not quite. <laughs> I'm extremely impressed having, you know, come to his poetry so recently. But I think we're definitely talking prodigy, and I have yet to know of a prodigy who I wouldn't say is a genius. So. And I think he had a very restless, you know, restlessness to, to his being, uh, almost a manic. It seems to me that he lived with so much intensity that it was almost like he lived his at least adult life in a mania, a manic state. I, I can't imagine someone like that sleeping. And he may not have had time to sleep too much or may not have, you know, and I don't mean manic that he's crazy. I just mean so energetic because that's what informs his poetry. It's, it's full of energy and exclamation points and demands to be recited aloud you know, and a call to arms. I mean, his historical poems about even San Jacinto and the Alamo are all but a call to arms. And I can just see him, you know, visualize him walking around these very grounds and under this tree and reciting his stuff, you know. And I would think he would draw a crowd if anyone overheard him. And I would have loved to hear him read, let's put it that way. I think he's criticized, from what little I've read of, of people who have tackled his work and criticized him, he's criticized for being doom and gloom and nihilistic and overly violent and sensational. Well, my poetry is very violent in many ways, and I'm Texas Poet Laureate because violence is a very powerful powerful part of inher its inherent in human nature. I mean, do we still have wars? I believe we do, unless they've ended. And, and we're going to have wars, sad to say, for the foreseeable future. Uh, our pulse itself is violent. The way the blood courses through our veins with enormous force. That's why we have strokes and aneurysms. But there's violence. There's violence in sex. Sex has an element. I don't want to get too explicit, but it has an element. Eroticism, you know, a violent overtone or undertone. So you can't really write seriously about the human condition and not tackle the subject of violence. Well, no That's one, my point. No one would read it. <laughs> and no one boring, would read it, certainly. <laughs> but you know, I think a lot of writers, I could see where a lot of writers of talent would be envious. Envious of Howard because his work had such enormous, immediate appeal, and editors of magazines wanted to pay him cash for his stories, and people couldn't get enough of him. I mean, you know, he just couldn't write fast enough for the markets that he developed, I think beginning about the age of 18, which is a mere child. I think he published his first story about the time he was a senior at Brownwood High School. And then he made enough money by his mid to late 20s to pay cash for a new car. And that was in the Depression era, for goodness sakes. I mean, that's unheard of for a writer, pulp or otherwise. I think part of his problem is being branded, perhaps prematurely, as a pulp writer. 
for some reason, you know, a lot of literati feel like if it's pulp, they dismiss it as being worthy. And I'm not so sure they're not jumping to a little, a few conclusions there, and they should give it a little more. Uh, Shakespeare, I'm told, 300 years ago, was extremely popular among the masses, many of whom were not well educated. All right, so would Shakespeare have been labeled a pulp playwright if he produced his plays today? Who knows? Interesting thought. But just because you're pulp doesn't mean you're a few other things in addition to being pulp. I don't know what the origin of the word pulp is. I should have long ago looked it up, but I'd love to see the etymology of pulp. Well, I think that's real exciting, but I think they should also, if, they, if they're interested in becoming creative writers themselves, I think they need to be reminded that he had exceptional ability and that they might not be able to. You shouldn't encourage fledgling writers to go with first drafts because most of them are garbage. <laughs> okay, so you have a level of talent here that's highly unusual. But the good thing about it is he was willing to work as hard as he needed to work to establish himself as a writer and not to have to work for someone else. And if that's not inspirational, I don't really know what is. But, but I think there should always be that caveat that, you know, let's look at what we're dealing with here, not the average writer. <laughs> it's thrilling. It's the ultimate vindication for a creative writer. And that's inspirational to me and anyone, I think, who's given a chunk of their conscious life to the creation of literature because it is so rare and, uh, I mean, I just don't see how anyone could not be inspired by what's happened. And I wish he could be here to see what's happened, because I think he would find it mind-boggling. Not, not that he didn't deserve it, because it was so different from what he experienced when he was getting his work out there. I think he was an actor. I think he was more than just a writer and he sort of had a, an artist persona in general. And he, and he didn't want to be perceived as a little wimp, you know, mama's boy that was a little sensitive poet. So he took up boxing. He said, hell, I'll show them. I'll work out and whoop their butt, which he did, I've heard. But I also think there's more to the boxing I think that he, wrote, he was so into hand-to-hand -hand combat, that's about as close as he could come to experiencing gladiatorial conflict is through duking it out with gloves in a ring. That's just, I've been thinking about that. So I'm not a bit surprised that he was intrigued by boxing and wrote wonderful stories about boxing, the sport of boxing. And uh, I like the fact that he wanted to act out what intrigued him so much as an artist, and not only, you know, just, just write it, but live the life of violence and contact and be successful, you know, be respected as a boxer. Have you ever boxed a few rounds with an opponent? And I don't think the gloves were, no, well, I mean, I haven't because I'm not <laughs> no, tough enough, I'd get my butt that. whipped. <laughs> but anyway, right but you know, it's very <laughs> exhausting. And it's dangerous. I mean, you can get a broken jaw, broken nose. You can get killed in a boxing ring. It's, it's a very violent sport, but highly skilled and requires phenomenal conditioning. And I just think it's fascinating. Everything that he decided to do, he seemed to do it with every ounce of his being. You know, there's one speed with Robert E. Howard, and that's cliched as it is, pedal to the metal or stay out of the car. I mean, you know, he lived his life like a comet, no matter what he did. He was good in school. He excelled in school. It wasn't learning he didn't like in school. He was an autodidact to a large extent from what I've read. He didn't have a degree. I don't think he ever got a college degree, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. He did not get a college degree, but he was a good student. He didn't like the authoritarian nature of a teacher and a student and a principal and a student because he thought, well, who's some, some other human being to have authority 
over me. I'm just as good as they are, and I'm a free spirit. To hell with that. I don't want a boss. I'll let you duds have a boss and all, but I'm going to be my boss, and I'll get paid for what I like to do. And he pulled it off. That's what's phenomenal. But there's a lot to admire from, from many, many aspects of uh, not only his work, but his life itself. 